Hello everyone, um, I'm happy uh, to present uh, our first speaker in the algebra seminar. The algebra seminar was uh, called before the field arithmetic seminar. And our first speaker is uh, Vlad Matai that is virtually in Tel Aviv, but physically in Romania. So, okay. Thank you, Lior, for inviting me. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to speak today about the automorphism uh, groups of smooth projective hypersurfaces over finite fields. So I'm going to try to avoid, you know, too much uh, algebraic geometry uh, for people. So most of the time, I'll, you know, you can think about polynomials for most of the things that I'll be talking about. Also, if something seems unclear, you know, just feel free to stop me and ask questions. I'm happy to answer them. And let me know also if I'm going too fast at any point, because, you know, doing slides, I usually sometimes go too fast. So let me know about that. Okay. So uh, let's start. Uh, you know, this is the outline. So the first part is going to be, you know, uh, not that complicated. The second part might be a little bit too technical. But anyway, I'll explain also what's going on in the second part. So uh, let me fix some definitions. Uh, so we're going to talk about curves and hypersurfaces. For people who are not familiar, PN is going to be denoting the n-dimensional projective space. And there are all these points under this equivalence relation, okay, that you can just rescale uh, to get you know, uh, an equivalent point. And you know, it you can also think about this as a compactification of the affine space if you want to think about you know the analysis way, but you know, this is not nothing you know than the projective space. And okay, uh, what do we mean by uh, curve of degree d? So a smooth projective, you know, geometric integral. Uh, so these are the geometry words, okay? You're just gonna have the vanishing locus of a polynomial uh, where this is homogeneous of degree d and you need the reducibility over the algebraic closure. And if you want a smoothness, so reducible over the algebraic closure gives you geometric integral. Smooth just means that you have, you know, non-vanishing partial derivatives at every point. Okay, so this is the definition just to fix it. Now, let me also fix some notation. Uh, so hyper surfaces is just going to be, in this definition, you put more variables in and the same words go here. Okay, so non-vanishing partial derivatives and so on. And I'm gonna denote with C a curve and X is going to be a hypersurface in general. Okay, so I'm gonna just to distinguish when I'm talking about curves and when I'm talking about hypersurfaces. And sometimes this world, uh, this word uh, genus is going to show up. But since I'm talking about smooth stuff, most of the time you can just think about it in terms of the degree. So this is just going to be equal to uh, this number here. And if you like to think about, you know, geometry analysis over the complex numbers, if you draw, you know, the curve, you're going to get um, what is called the Riemann surface. And basically this is the number of holes you see in the Riemann surface. So. That's another way to uh, picture this, just to have the notation. Okay, so let's start talking about automorphisms, which are the main thing in the talk. So the geometric way to think about automorphisms is this is going to be an injective and subjective map on the points of the curve. Um, that's one way to define it. But for us, uh, since we're gonna talk mostly about polynomials, this is just going to be a change of variables. But the change of variables, be careful, is just going to be rational functions in the three, you know, in the variables x0, x1, and x2. So I'm going to do examples soon so you understand what uh, exactly we get for this. But it turns out that this actually forms a group. And for a hypersurface x, you can just, you know, uh, change the number of variables here and you get, you know, more complicated rational functions because you have more variables. Uh, Vlad, just uh, making sure you're talking about regular automorphisms. Yeah, yeah. So just regular automorphism. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask? You want yeah. phi to be separable or something for it, like to have a. Um, like Frobenius will be an automorphism for you. Uh, so if I'm talking about finite fields, yeah, Frobenius is going to be an automorphism. Okay. okay so and you can think about finite fields. You know, if you want to think about it in the polynomial way, it's just going to be x to the q. So you know, raise h every corner to the power q. So you can think about it still. Yeah, after. but this is not an actual automorphism, right? Uh, I mean, over this there. This is over the algebraic closure. Ah, uh, so, you're, okay. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, Perfect. so yeah. So here you have to be a little bit careful because I'm hiding sometimes the algebraic closure in the background. Okay. And so, you know, let me just do some examples so we get used to uh, 
these kind of things. So there are some obvious, you know, automorphism that if you write down some equation, you can figure out some obvious things. For example, you know, this is called the hyperelliptic curve. And this has the obvious one that you can just change, you know, keep X the same, change Y to minus Y, and that's it. Now, this one is a little more symmetric. So this is a rather more interesting one. And it has some obvious ones. Again, you can swap around the coordinates. So you can make X go to Y, you know, Y goes to Z and Z goes to X and so on. Or you can rescale things by, you know, the roots of uh, unity, which are the D root of unity. And you can do this for X, you can do this for Y also, but, you know, you don't need to do for all of them because, you know, you saw the projective equivalence at the beginning. So, you know, there's only uh, kind of two kind of new D subgroups here. But I'm gonna make this clear once I write what the automorphism group is a little later on. Now, let me do something non-obvious. So non-obvious is I have this, you know, uh, curve here. Uh, so one other thing that I might say is that I kind of cheated. These two are in affine I, equation. I, okay? I, I. Yeah. So in the second example, the automorphism group is the Ritz product or? Yeah, so it's going to be actually, I'm gonna write explicitly what it is later uh, in the slides, but it's the Ritz product of S3 with, you know, new D cross new D. Uh, so this is kind of a guess, but it's not obvious that these are all of them. So this is what I wanna emphasize. Like there's some obvious ones, but then, you know, it's not obvious that it's all of them. And let me give you an unobvious example. So you have this equation here and you see this is a rather more complicated formula here. Like, you invert X and then you have this rational function here showing up, okay, that's that. And finally, there are these special curves which are elliptic curves. And for them, you have a ton of automorphisms because these have a group law. So translating by a point on the elliptic curve is going to give you an automorphism. And also uh, this addition operation is actually giving you rational functions for the coordinates. So then you can think about it still as polynomials if you want to, so um, that's that. Okay, so these are examples. And now let me get to actually what do we know about these automorphisms. It turns out that over any field, the automorphism group of a smooth curve is going to be finite. So Schmidt was the first one to prove it and then Matsumura and Monsky gave it for any. So this I think was characteristic zero and this is any characteristic, okay? So it's even characteristic P. Uh, do you mean the genus is at least two or something? Yeah, so yeah, so sorry. Yeah, the genus is at least two, yeah, because again, when I said this, I already kind of implied that it's going to be infinite here. Yeah, okay. And over C, you also have, you know, again, genus at least two, I should say. Uh, Hurwitz showed this bound for the automorphism group, that um, the automorphism is bounded by this number here times G minus one. And I won't get into the proof, but just saying a little words about it, you just take the automorphism group, quotient your curve and think about it as a ramified covering and use that. Okay, and then what happens over characteristic uh, P in finite characteristic? Well, you get this other bound here. So why does this change qualitatively from here to here? Well, when I did that, I talked about that ramified covering in characteristic P you get basically wild ramification. So this changes the quality of this kind of bound here. So, you know, and then you can improve it. So a little bit of history, you can improve this to a little better. This is eight G cubed and you can make, you know, four exceptions. And, you know, there's, I mean, I don't want to get in all these kind of details here, but there's a whole industry of people working in improving these bounds, finding special cases and so on. So, you know, uh, there's a whole industry of like finding better bounds, classifying exceptions and so on. And let me give you some examples, you know, where you have large automorphism groups. So for example, here's one. Okay, so this curve here in characteristic two and the genus is going to be this number and you can see this pretty large automorphism group here. Okay, so maybe here I should have wrote the size of the automorphism group, sorry. So the size is this guy here. Okay, so that's one thing. Then you have this rocket curve that, again, you have this, Q minus one over two here, and you get, you know, PC, PSL2 or PGL2, which is like, you know, uh, basically it's going to be again, a cubic uh, kind of thing. And let me get to the example that I wrote before, namely this is called the Fermat curve. And as I told you, this uh, is going to be generated by this and this, but actually it's really funny because in finite characteristic, 
So this result here would work over C, but in finite characteristic, you can have weird phenomena. And this is going to give you something rather different if this number here n is going to be one plus Q. Okay, so generically is this thing and then it changes when you have these finite characteristic phenomena. Okay, so this is enough about uh, curves. And again, what I wanna emphasize about you know, computing this out is like, we can only do it for very specific examples. Like, you know, if I write down a very random equation, just, you know, pick your favorite lottery numbers, it's kind of very hard to show anything about this one except being finite and maybe you're luckily having some symmetry that you can see something, but kind of very hard to, you know, compute things down. Okay, and now if I switch to hypersurfaces, the same thing is true that the automorphism group is finite, but we know very little, you know, um, about quantitative bounds, but I'll say what we know. So for example, you know, I'm just writing down something very special where you can prove something that this equation here has automorphism group, this guy here, which is PSL2F11. And what do we know about the general bound about the size of this group is that, okay, let me say what this is. So linear automorphisms are going to be induced by the ambient projective space. So they're basically going to be linear transformations, kind of like, uh, so linear polynomials for each of the variables. And you can prove that this is bounded this way. Okay, so the ones that come from linear transformations, basically in automorphisms are going to be bounded by this exponential thing. Okay. So this is what we, kind of know in summary. There is a lot, as I said, there's still a lot of things that are proven out there, but this is kind of a summary of the things we know. And obviously the question is, what do we really expect in general about the automorphism group? So as I said, if I pick the lottery and I just pick some random numbers for my equation, the answer is that you expect it to be trivial. You don't expect to see anything except the trivial automorphism for your uh, hypersurface or curve. You know, if there's no good reason, there's no symmetry there, there should be no reasons for something to exist. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, if you go back to all these equations, this is pretty symmetric. So like it has some hidden symmetry in it, you know, so all of these guys, if I go back to them, they have some sort of symmetry already built into the equations. Okay, so what kind of do we know about this general statement? Well, we know some examples. So we know how to construct things uh, with trivial automorphism groups. So Bailey was the first one to do this. Uh, and then Monsky generalized this for algebraically closed fields of arbitrary characteristic. So again, even constructing things with trivial one, I think this was in the 60s, I think. Hurwitz claimed to this to be true, but only in the 60s, I think Bailey was the first guy to construct examples. And then, Akla, you know, did something further, constructed more examples. Then he can construct some examples analytically. And uh, in 2001, so these are two different papers. That's why I put it like this. Poonen also constructed examples with trivial automorphism group and, you know, also hypersurfaces with no non-trivial automorphisms. Okay. So this is kind of, you know, a summary of what do we know about this general statement that this one should be trivial. And let me give you uh, some more piece of evidence for this statement. So um, I'm gonna consider this. So if you're not familiar with moduli spaces, think about this as a parameter space for, for all the curves. Uh, so this is decorated with something else, but this is um, a parameter space. So think about a very curve of a given genus as a point in this space. So I'm not gonna talk too much about the geometry of this space, but what I wanna point out is that in this space here, there's an open subset that corresponds to things with trivial automorphism. So, you know, if you think about the analogy with analysis, open subset means almost everything. So uh, that means almost everything has trivial automorphism. Now, the thing that I wanna point out is that this doesn't give you any kind of quantitative thing out of it. So it just tells you, you know, so that's why maybe the analogy we see is sometimes not good because this one cannot be turned into a quantitative statement uh, of saying that, you know, if you count all the curves, then you get automorphism group trivial most of the time. So 
this cannot be turned into a kind of a counting argument. Um, good. But this also provides you that if you take a large enough field, you get trivial automorphism group examples. That's at least something that this thing can provide uh, as a statement. But again, it gives you reason to believe that you know the trivial automorphism group should be the generic thing happening all the time. Um, okay, so let me get now to actually what I show. So let me make a definition. Um, so I'm gonna denote with S and D is going to be the set of smooth degree D hypersurfaces in projective space. Okay, so this is going to be this set here. And what I show is that if you don't have this, N and D not equal to this, and you know, two and three and three and four. So I'm gonna tell you the reason why that is a little bit when I talk about the ingredients in the proof. But basically I show that the number of hypersurfaces with a non-trivial uh, automorphism group, and be careful about this. This is only over FQ. So I'm gonna make a comment a little bit later. And it's also gonna be clear from the proof that my proof is not going to work for the algebraic closure. So the desirable thing would be to replace this with the algebraic closure, because then you would have a quantitative statement of the moduli thing, okay? So I show that this is going to be that, and you get a power saving here. So uh, this constant here shows that there's a power saving, because in total, um, so I'm gonna put up a statement soon, but roughly in total, there are Q to the N plus D choose D curves. Because you know there's this many polynomials, and smoothness is going to happen generically. So I'm going to put a statement soon enough about that, that almost everything is smooth. But you know this is going to basically give you a quantitative version of what I wrote before. And so the consequence is this basically: so that you get you know trivial automorphism group on average. Again, only talking about the FQ here. Okay. So any questions up to now about this? Okay, so let me say a little bit you know, about the ingredients in the proof. So first, let me make that clarification that I told you that almost everything is moved. So there is this uh, amazing theorem by Poonen that shows that you know, in the large degree limit here, the number of smooth hypersurfaces is going to tend to this number here. Now, you don't have to get scared if you've never seen the Zeta's function of the projective space. Okay, I just wrote the definition for you what it is. But also I wanna point out that if you look at this, it should be very familiar if you like analytic number theory, thinking about smooth hypersurface the same as thing like square free integers. Because you're not smooth, you're not a smooth number if you have a square inside you. So this should be like, you know, the proportion of square free integers is exactly like a Zeta, one over Zeta of something. So it's very similar to that kind of thing. And actually the proof is also very similar to that thing in analytic number theory, namely you use what is called the closed point theorem. So the same idea that you would have from like regular integers would work to prove this statement here. So except that there's more algebraic geometry behind it and you know, the proof is not that easy. That's one thing I wanna say, but your intuition of why this number shows up is again, just coming from the integers. It makes sense why it shows up. Okay. Okay. The other thing that why do I need not two and three? This is obvious because these were elliptic curves. And this is here, uh, this is going to be quartic uh, surfaces and they, they're also very special. But the magic thing is that all automorphisms are going to be linear. So this tells you that you don't have to consider very complicated polynomials like I had in some examples before everything is going to be linear and nice. So it comes from like PGLN. So linear transformations are going to give you all the automorphisms of your hypersurface. So somehow it makes your life easier when you're looking for them because all you have to do is just linear automorphisms. Okay, so that's one thing. And now uh, this is the second step and this motivates the following thing. So that's why this is kind of the essence of the proof, uh, namely this equality here. So when you count the average size of the automorphism, you get this thing here. And now what you can do 
is you can switch the summation. So you can ask yourself, if you give me a matrix here in PGLM plus one, how many times does this show up as an automorphism of something? Okay, so that's kind of why the proof wouldn't work in any way over the algebraic closure, because obviously this is infinite summation. So once you use uh, this step can here- I, Can I ask something, Vlad, yeah. if you go back to your previous slide? Yeah. Um, so you know a priori that the automorphisms are linear. Yeah. But so you know that they are linear over the algebraic closure. Why do you know that they are linear over the base field? So let me. So I think this is just. Um, oh yeah. So here, they're not linear over the. So here, because I only consider over F Q. So in my problem, I only consider them over FQ. Indeed, here you would have to consider them over the algebraic closure. So, but at least you narrow down that they're only linear. So yeah, that's a good question. But what the problem when I'm considering them is only things that are defined over FQ. Okay. Does that answer your question? I'm still trying to think if, if you have the linear automorphism over, over you know. So think about the example extension. with x to the d plus y to d plus z to the d. If the roots of unity are not in your field, then you need to extend your field, right? Yes. Okay, and you see that those are defined over, you know, the algebraic closure, basically. So, so you have to argue could, that anything which is linear over, over an extension and is defined over the base field is automatically linear and uh, is a linear map with coefficients in the base field. That's, that's the claim. Uh, no, so I'm not claiming that. So that's not necessarily true. So I'm claiming that in, so again, all I'm doing is only using the automorphisms that are actually living in FQ. There are FQ coefficients by the decoration here. Okay, I have to think about this. Okay, because again, I can't prove this over the algebraic closure. That's why, you know, this whole thing that I'm writing here is not going to work over the algebraic closure. Um, okay, so again, now we're trying to understand this side here to understand, again, how many times for a given matrix, you know, this automorphism shows up. So this motivates this definition here that, um, and since we're talking about projective linear transformations, I need to introduce this land also here, but you can just ignore it for all intents and purposes. So we define this space here uh, of polynomials that transform accordingly to this matrix. So uh, they're basically, A is basically an automorphism of the curve given by F. And also notice that I didn't say anything about smooth. So that's why the, here I'm also using Poonen's theorem. So I'm just taking all the polynomials without caring anymore about being smooth or not. So, because again, Poonen tells me that the positive proportion is smooth. So we don't really need to worry about having anything like smooth in this definition here. And again, the key now to controlling this part here is going to be the following. Namely that if you're not going to be a scalar multiple of the identity, then the dimension of this space here is going to be bounded like this. So that's kind of the key to controlling this part here, is to show that this bound here holds. And this is just going to be you know, some fun linear algebra, so I won't get into the details of this, but this is just uh, a linear algebra uh, part here. And I also wanna say a little bit about the quantitative aspect of this. So I'm not assuming this is the best bound. So let me make a remark about it. So I really believe that this is not going to be in any way sharp uh, because I believe that only the diagonal one. So we need to avoid a scalar times identity. So the best we can do is maybe change the sign on one of the coordinates and keep the rest of the coordinates the same. So let's say you have an even degree somewhere. And then you get, uh, an estimate, which should be this, okay? So if you do just some asymptotic, then the curves that are preserved by this automorphism are going to be roughly this number. And the part that I have here 
is going to be, you know, roughly asymptotically equal to this. So, you know, there's a big difference of quantitative things between these and these. Um, so, I mean, it wouldn't give you anything better because the average will be still one. But what I want to remark is that um, when I go back to this theorem that I wrote here, this constant that you have here, this also allows you to extend a little bit your field. So this is going to allow you to get some power here, you know, depending on this constant, to say that the automorphisms, you know, defined over these larger extensions are also mostly trivial. And, you know, this would give you a better uh, extension than what I wrote by using this. Okay, so, um, yeah, so this is the main ingredient in the proof. And as I told you, this part here is just going to be uh, mostly just linear algebra. So it's not something very complicated. Okay, um, so the things that I'm uh, going to talk about now are a little bit more technical. So I wanna talk a little bit about some geometric implications uh, for this uh, kind of theorem about the trivial Vlad, the Vlad, can, can yeah. you please, you, you ask that uh, I'll stop you if it's too fast. Yeah. Can you go back a slide? Because yeah. I, I didn't manage to, to, to see yeah. it. So, so you have a bound on the dimension of, of this, this space here. Is, is it a fiber or, or? So this is going to be, if you look here at the summation, okay? This is exactly, I'm counting here exactly this space. This PA of lambda is basically this part here. And lambda is x or? So lambda is just some constant. Because uh, the problem is that the automorphisms from PN are basically PGLN. So you need to rescale your polynomial maybe. So, you know, I just have to carry this around just, you know, to make the definition consistent. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Okay, so yeah, so this is the bound that I have. And again, this, if you go back to this expression here, you know, plug it in and you get exactly what you want because there's not a ton of things here. Um, okay, so the questions that remain, obviously, before I get, you know, to the more geometric discussion. So the questions that remain uh, are obviously, you know, can you prove this result? So what I would really want to prove is the result over the algebraic closure. So that's maybe one goal. I'm still thinking about this problem without any success. Um, the other things you might try to prove is, um, obviously you can try to get another family, maybe a nicer family of curves where you can control things. Uh, so maybe you write some nice family of curves, you know, and you show something about automorphisms. But what I wanna point out is that really, uh, if you're taking a family of curves, you have trouble that you need to prove some statement about how many smooth things you have over. So uh, there's at least two obstacles, you know, if you're doing something in a family, because uh, that's one other way you can go about it. Uh, the other thing is I didn't say anything about fields of definition when I was talking about the moduli problem. So if you like anything number two, you can say, oh, let me take my favorite equations, let's say over the integers. So take a rational, you know, equation with rational coefficients, naturally there, you can take the height function on the coefficients. And you can ask the same question, like, you know, take your coefficients of your uh, hypersurface in some box and, you know, and you let the size of the box go to infinity and ask how many have trivial automorphism group. It should be still true that it's one, okay? So, um, so this is a different kind of question, but, you know, still makes sense if you wanna think about a different analytic number three question. Uh, and this is still related to the automorphism side, uh, the moduli you know, manifestation. Um, so is it known, for example, how many smooth curves or hypersurfaces that there are in this model? Uh, so, yeah, so actually I asked somebody because I'm not that good at analytic number three and um, because you have the discriminant method, you can show that 0% are basically uh, singular. So you can show that as the height of your box or height of the coefficients goes to infinity, 0% are going to be non-smooth. So can you say something more precise about the R term there? Uh, so I don't know about the R term there. So I don't remember off the top maybe of my head. Square, maybe you get a square root uh, saving? 
it's not similar to the seed methods. When, when the prime is B, then modulo P, you just use the algebraic geometry and then you can lift it by large seed or something like this. But the problem is, so you can't do um, algebraic geometry because um, there's a problem. When you do reduction modulo any prime, you're gonna get primes of bad reduction. No, no, and for modulo, modulo large prime, not modulo any prime. Uh, if you modulo. take a large prime, then irreducibility remains. And then you just have Bertini that tells you that everything is, uh, everything is almost smooth, uh, almost everything is smooth, modulo P, and then maybe you can lift it. I didn't think about the details, but this seems like falling into standout. Uh, yeah, so the way I was thinking it, uh, uh, so somebody told me is that you can oh, use nice. uh, Brown's method for you know the sorting out this just over Q without using uh, any characteristic P. Maybe you'll get something more effective or better. Yeah. Okay, so you know these are you know different directions you can go with this question, and you know the most time I've been spending it is trying to make this work over the algebraic closure unsuccessfully. Um, okay, so let me talk a little bit about the harder part, which is the geometry part. So I want to talk a little bit about the consequences of this uh, thing over uh, moduli spaces. Okay, so let me introduce something. So. You've seen a, before a moduli space, but now let me introduce a more uh, general one. So again, this is the moduli space of degree D hypersurfaces in projective space. And this is going to be, you know, take all the smooth uh, hypersurfaces, okay? You, you can even take all of them and you mod out by PGLM plus one, which is uh, the automorphism group of the ambient projective space. Okay, so again, you don't really have to worry about the geometric construction, but this is the definition of it. Okay, and it has some nice geometric property that it's still not necessarily a very nice space because you can have uh, points which are in quotes fractional points. So that's why we call it the stack, okay? Um, but the, the thing is that it's still a very nice space to consider. And if you, uh, are thinking about FQ points on this space, this is going to count out exactly isomorphism classes of these things, of projective hypersurface of degree D. Okay, so this is what uh, this quantity here counts. Okay, and now what's another way to count points on this? Well, I told you something about uh, fractional points. Namely, each thing is going to be weighted by the automorphism group. So each hypersurface gets a point and each point has a mass, basically. It's how many automorphisms it has. So that means that this is the number of points on it is just going to be this expression here, okay? So that's one way to count points on it. And obviously, since I proved something about the automorphism group here, it's obviously going to have some implication about what the size of this is. Okay, so you get this quantitative statement here. Uh, so I'm using some other result in the background, but um, you get that this is going to be equal to this, and this is going to be that. So what I'm secretly using in the background is I need some error term for Poonen's theorem, which was proven by Kedlai and Booker. Okay, so this is where this thing shows up from, is that you need some error term for Poonen's uh, Bertini's theorem. And this is, you know, the best qualitative thing you can get at the moment. It's going to be this saving, which is, you know, <coughs> not that big. Okay, so kind of what's the point of uh, writing this down. So this is where it gets a little bit complicated. So there is a way to, if you have some here, think about a variety. So if you think about a variety, there's another way to count points on it. So you can plug in things in your polynomial, try to count that way. There are algorithms that give you that. But there's also another way to count points on your space. Namely, there's a link between the geometry of your space and counting points over finite fields. 
And this is basically called the Grothendieck Lefschetz trace flame. So there's a way to go from geometry. So this is a very complicated machinery, but there's a way to go from the geometry of the space to points on it. Uh, and here it gets a little more technical because it's not a nice space. So what I said is this one is generally used for projective varieties, but there's a way to make it work also in this situation. Okay, so there's a little more complicated machinery, but there's a way to do that. And what it does is basically it relates the cohomology of your space, uh, which is something from algebraic topology. And I'm not gonna say which kind of uh, cohomology, the word for it is a tau cohomology, but for the sakes of uh, this discussion, you can think about singular cohomology. So if you're a topologist, you know, uh, every variety comes um, with some singular cohomology attached to it. Okay, so there are these invariants. Um, and there's a way to use this, you know, to count points. It's a little more complicated because there's also arithmetic input uh, here. But the geometry tells you something about the number of points on your space. Okay. And Orsola basically proved that over the complex numbers, the cohomology is going to vanish. Okay, so the first degrees in the cohomology vanish. And what I want to say about the formula is that this resembles what's happening here. So this tells you that there's a gap between the powers here of Q. And if you're, you know, if you're thinking about the way I'm thinking about things, is whenever this gap shows up in some formula that you see uh, over finite fields. Whenever this gap shows up, there's sometimes a pretty good geometrical reason why this gap shows up. And the best explanation for it is that this statement here shows up, that the cohomology of something vanishes. Of course, you know, this is kind of the best hope we have because weird things also can happen. Like it might happen that things cancel out. So I'm gonna say some words, but um, you can ignore them. So sometimes it can happen that the eigenvalues for the Frobenius cancel out. So you have something with a plus one or something with a minus one. So when you apply this formula, they cancel out making this other terms here disappear. But somehow, generally we believe that that's such a strange phenomena that it shouldn't occur in nature. Somehow, you know, when you see this, you're not kind of led to believe that, which seems- Sometimes it cancel out because there is some symmetry that sometimes it might be even natural symmetry. Yeah. And Okay, um, but I want to point out is that this guy here is you can't use this result and use this machinery to go back to get what I wrote. So there is a direction you can speculate about things, but just knowing a little bit like this and knowing this formula doesn't usually help you to go the other way around. Because what can happen is that um, this space might be so complicated. So I wanna say something a little bit about the moduli space of curves. So this is such a big topic that, you know, even the cohomology of it, we don't know about it. So there's a lot of mystery about, you know, why the cohomology of it is, we know some pieces of the cohomology, but the problem is that generally speaking, this space has a very large Euler characteristic. Uh, even the moduli space of curves has a very, large characteristic, uh, error characteristic, which is kind of super exponential. So, and what that means is that there's a ton of cohomology out there. And since we don't know, you know, how many things there are out there, you can have something, you know, maybe showing up with a Q cubed, but there are so many things in the cohomology group, like something like Q to the a billion that it jumps up your power. So, you know, there's no way to just, you know, knowing a little bit, there's no way you can control the whole thing. So if you wanna use this kind of machinery to say something, you need to control also what happens down the line. So you need some control about the cohomology further down the line. Um, but at least, you know, it tells you that, you know, something should happen with the cohomology here. So this gives you reason to believe that something should happen here with the cohomology. Okay. Um, and yeah. I know this is a bit short, but this is uh, all I really wanted to say about this. Um, okay, so if I went a little bit fast, you know, you can ask me more questions about things, but I'll stop here.
Thank you very much. Uh, are there uh, further questions? Yes.